السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله مساءكم جميعا بكل خير آه يسعدنا أن نكون في الجزء الثاني من اللقاء العلمي آه من تنظيم إدارة الشؤون الأكاديمية والتدريب ومديرية الشؤون الصحية بجدة آه اللقاء الأول كان عن المعلومات الأساسية عن الكوفيد 19 Uh, we reviewed the important evidence regarding prevention of COVID-19, the current available evidence and resources. And then we went through all the, the local data about COVID-19 and uh, comparison of the global data. Today, we will be shedding light on the management of COVID-19. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to me to introduce Dr. Zakia. Dr. Zakia Abdelbadi Bukhari, she's a consultant in internal medicine and infectious disease in the Ministry of uh, Health. Uh, Dr. Zakia is a senior consultant. She has a long uh, history of practicing uh, internal medicine and also in training and education as a clinical a training and an examiner. Uh, she is holding a degree on uh, Saudi Board of Internal Medicine and the ID Infectious Disease Fellowship from King uh, Faisal Specialist Hospital in Riyadh. I'm quite sure we will all enjoy the recent update and regarding the protocol uh, of MOH management COVID-19. Uh, please share me uh, the honor to welcome Dr. Zaki. Ahlan, Dr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, jamiyan. أبدأ بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nisreen, uh, for the introduction and thanks for Dr. Zainab and the organizing committee for uh, asking me to present uh, this class for you, which is about the COVID-19 Saudi Ministry of Health Management Protocol. Um, I declare I have no financial conflict of interest and this presentation is intended for educational purposes. And um, please refer to the appropriate approved pro uh, product information regarding any drug uh, mentioned in this presentation. The objectives of uh, this course is to illustrate the healthcare services by Saudi uh, Ministry of Health and try to build a standard clinical approach to COVID-19 patients and their therapeutic management. It will be divided into two parts. The first part will start by a brief introduction, including uh, pathophysiology, and then I will introduce you to the case definition, uh, followed by a description of the clinical characteristics. Um, in the second part, I'll discuss COVID-19 Saudi Ministry of Health uh, Management Protocol, ending with the key concepts related to management uh, issues, mainly therapeutic issues. This is a simple viral uh, structure, simplified. As you can see, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is a single-stranded RNA virus uh, having multiple uh, proteins on the surface. More importantly, the spike protein or the S-spike. The median incubation period is five to, uh, to four to five days, which is the time interval period between the infection, the person who gets infected, and then the time until they develop initial yeah. symptoms. Majority of those who get infected, um, they will develop symptoms between two to seven days. And it was found that it's rarely and reported um, less than 1%. Dr. Zakia, uh, did you share the screen with us? The yes. slides? Oh. Yes. It's not showing? Uh, I cannot see it. And uh, I can see a couple of the people who are following this not seeing the screen. Yeah, we can see you, but not these slides. Not the screen, okay. I think I did. Now? Yes, this now it's coming, yes. But so we aren't to nip that, yes. Great. All right. So, just wanna enlarge it, go to the... Slideshow. Are you a slideshow? Yes. Great. Good. So rarely and less than 1% will develop symptoms beyond 14 days. This is an important slide and this um, diagram or uh, drawing is adopted from the Google website. Uh, I adopted it from um, images in Google related to pathogenesis and pathophysiology of uh, COVID uh, illness and SARS-CoV-2 viral infection. Uh, we know that uh, according to the current available information, the transmission is, this virus is transmitted through respiratory droplets. 
and uh, contamination or touching uh, contaminated surfaces through fecal secretions as the virus is secreted uh, with uh, gastrointestinal uh, secretions. However, the infectiousity of this virus is not uh, really documented. Anyhow, once the virus enters the human body, it attacks the respiratory system. And in the respiratory system, particularly it attacks the pneumocyte type two, which is the responsible of the surfactant production. At a cellular level, a complex um, biochemical procedures will be um, uh, attaching the virus uh, through its spike proteins uh, to the ACE angiotensin converting enzyme uh, two receptors, allowing it to enter. And once it enters the cell, uh, the uh, single stranded RNA uh, will be released. Uh, will go through um, uh, multiple uh, translation processes utilizing the cytoplasmic proteases and uh, uh, forming another RNA particles uh, utilizing the uh, RNA dependent or the, the RNA dependent RNA polymerases, combining the protein parts and the messenger RNA parts. Um, more viral particles will be released with the resultant damage to the whole cell. And what this, uh, what does this damage will cause? It will cause, it will initiate and stimulate uh, macrophage mediated inflammation with the release of cytokines um, affecting uh, almost every vital organ in the body, the brain and um, the uh, lung pneumocyte cells locally producing capillary leakage, uh, um, alveolar edema, which will be manifested as a shortness of breath and difficulty of breathing. Other um, severe uh, inflammatory response with a cytokine storm can affect other organs with the resultant organ, uh, multi-organ dysfunction, um, ARDS and uh, septicemia and shock. So having talked briefly it, uh, brief, very briefly about the pathogenesis, which is important to understand uh, the, um, how the disease develops. Uh, we, will, we will need to understand uh, how, how common clinical presentations will be presenting. Commonly, patients with fever, commonly patients with fever will present with fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath. And uh, they might show gastrointestinal symptoms, diarrhea, in the form of diarrhea. However, abdominal pain and vomiting can occur. Other um, symptoms were confirmed by the CDC in uh, April 28, uh, including chills, myalgias, uh, or fatigue, uh, muscle pain, headache, sore throat, repeat, uh, repeated shaking with chills and loss of taste and smell. Now, these, these sound like um, a usual upper respiratory tract infection or a flu-like illness uh, causing pulmonary and extra pulmonary manifestations. However, a medical attention is immediately indicated when, uh, when a patient have one of these uh, of, of the following. Difficulty of breathing with um, dyspnea, shortness of breath, uh, rapid respiratory rate, and persistent chest pain or pressure in the chest, vague tightness, etc. Cyanosis, which, um, which is a sign of hypoxemia and confusion, a sign of um, septicemia. Um, the, the patients uh, will start their journey of medical evaluation uh, once they have common um, clinical presentation or symptoms uh, from the ER uh, or through a tele, uh, telephone call to the doctor. And this is the uh, screening score system uh, released by the Ministry of Health, um, defining the suspected case and defining the confirmed case. Suspect case is defined actually when you have a clinical presentation compatible with um, respiratory symptoms occurring acutely and in a setting of exposure, uh, whether traveling to a geographical uh, area, um, being in contact with somebody who's known to have COVID uh, or uh, um, uh, working as a healthcare worker. When you have a laboratory a PCR uh, positive test, the suspected case will be confirmed. There are some atypical clinical presentations which uh, occur in those who are susceptible, like elderly, obese, children, um, immune compromised. Uh, there are case reports, many case reports reported from different countries in the world, China, Italy, USA, 
reporting some of these. And uh, um, I, I can tell you, being uh, medically evaluating COVID uh, illness in patients in uh, uh, the affected area for the last six weeks, I can tell you I've seen many of these um, having uh, COVID positive uh, manifestations, which are not related to fever and no cough. However, they might uh, start having upper respiratory tract infection in a form of uh, mild rhinorrhea and nasal congestion. Then they can develop a sputum production, uh, occasional hemoptysis on and off. Um, ocular manifestations can occur, and I have seen uh, acute conjunctivitis in six cases, cardiac arrhythmias. There were three patients presenting with acute arrhythmia, palpitation, and chest pain. Uh, neurologic manifestations, dizziness, headache, confusion, dermatologic manifestations in the form of a rash, microbubular rash, blisters. And uh, lately, there are reports of Kawasaki disease occurring in children. So although these are rare manifestations, but it's good to keep it in your mind uh, for those who are susceptible. And in March 20, the, the, there was a proposed diagram uh, dividing and categorizing the COVID-19 illness into a spectrum uh, and different stages, clinical stages. The first stage was an early stage, which is um, a mild symptoms where you don't have uh, lower respiratory evidence of lower respiratory tract uh, involvement. A second stage where you have an evidence of lower respiratory tract involvement uh, manifested by chest X-ray and uh, moderately uh, to severe symptoms in a form of respiratory symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, fever, as I said before, uh, with no hypoxemia in stage 2A, but they can progress rapidly to uh, having hypoxemia. And once that happens, they will rapidly progress into acute respiratory distress syndrome or critical illness. Uh, authors of this publication hypothesize that theoretically, understanding the pathogenesis and the pathophysiology and the different clinical phases of the disease and the illness will be very helpful in directing the antiviral therapy, which I will come to uh, in the therapeutic guide of MOH. Providing different line of treatment uh, with different life mechanisms or different uh, mechanisms of actions at different stages. Saudi uh, Ministry of Health protocol uh, for patients included uh, a protocol for those who are suspected and confirmed. Um, now, when the patient present first as a suspect case, uh, going through a process of confirmation, uh, if clinically they have mild to moderate symptoms, they're further subcategorized into those who are having uh, mild to moderate symptoms with no shortness of breath or with no shortness of breath in high-risk patients or with shortness of breath in high-risk patients. So as you can see, the common... Uh, problem here is the shortness of breath, and it's very significant. Shortness of breath is the significant um, symptomatology, which you have to follow in your uh, medical evaluation of patients. All of these will require in the initial respiratory triage or emergency room, if they are sick and not stable and go going to the hospital, these uh, laboratory workup and radiology baseline just X-ray, um, if, if the case is classified as mild to moderate with no shortness of breath or, yeah, with no shortness of breath, the whole treatment uh, will be directed toward the supportive treatment, uh, giving IV fluid hydration, analgesics, acetaminophen uh, as an antibiotic, relieving fever, <laughs> relieving myalgias. Sorry? In high-risk patients, in high-risk patients, whether they have shortness of breath or they don't have shortness of breath, the case has to be discussed with the infectious disease specialist. And then one might consider hospital admission uh, according to the uh, admission criteria. Uh, and the treatment will be upgraded to include supportive therapy plus antiviral therapy. Confirmed cases will be managed almost similarly to the previous uh, suspect case. Uh, making sure a patient is not hypoxemic, uh, setting well, uh, not having a desaturation. Um, as I said, supportive treatment uh, and uh, to consider hospital admission for high-risk people. 
coming to the, uh, the, the most important uh, topic in this presentation, which is the uh, therapeutic uh, specific antiviral treatment, uh, our protocol in Ministry of Health recommended to start hydroxychloroquine, the anti-inflammatory. Um, if it's not available, use chloroquine. Uh, I'm not going to discuss details of this uh, dosing regimen for adults or pediatrics, which are uh, managed the same. Uh, but the thing, I, I just want to highlight how important it is to unify the approach and uh, start giving hydroxychloroquine according to the protocol and uh, carefully and cautiously watch for the side effects, drug side effects, including contraindications to give either one of those drugs, anti-malaria or the hydroxychloroquine, um, watching metabolic consequences and um, cardiac, uh, more importantly, the cardiac adverse effect with the QT. Uh, interval prolongation. And there is an attached um, medical information rela related to each drug in uh, Ministry of Health protocol. Um, trying to validate the issue of QT uh, interval prolongation, because uh, this, these drugs faced a lot of resistance from physicians to use it, and there was a lot of debate in the literature. Um, the American uh, College of Cardiology released this screening score sheet ending up scoring uh, some of the risk factors and the QT uh, prolongation itself, uh, categorizing patients into low, moderate versus um, high risk patients. But when validating these, uh, this sco uh, screening score, I found this uh, interesting information in the literature. Uh, the, this uh, table was released in 2013. It goes back to 2013. And uh, validation of the uh, data showed it has a low sensitivity with a low positive predictive value. What does that tell you or tell me practically as a clinician and as a physician? I don't like to see any patient here scoring moderate or high. If they are scoring low or normal, I'll be happy and go ahead and give the uh, drugs. If they're scoring high, I'll be more cautious, but again, I will not hold the important treatment for them thinking that they are high risk and not to give the uh, indicated drug here because of the low positive predictive value. Uh, however, there will be another good reasons to worry about giving uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine in patients who are high risk for the QT prolongation, including elderly and diabetics or men uh, as a male gender having a double risk factor for COVID illness severity and for uh, QT uh, prolongation. Uh, keep in mind, QT calculation uh, by the ECG usually uh, can give false negative and it has to be corrected to the heart rate. Uh, the relationship between QT prolongation and heart rate is um, reversible. Uh, it's, it's sort of inverse, inverse exponential relationship. What does that mean? It means with the increasing heart rate, which can be seen quite good in COVID patients, there will be a shortening, giving a lower screening score. And a lower screening score might um, not uh, be of uh, good positive predictive value to uh, predict the actual risk of the patient. Now for all of the above, as an ID specialist, we uh, tend to have a cardiologist, a cardiologist opinion and a verbal linguistic report rather than reading only ECG machines before starting any treatment. Uh, this drug, which is uh, according to the protocol uh, recommended uh, for uh, mild to moderate cases with uh, no shortness of breath was um, uh, used uh, in some areas of the world as outpatient or home management. Uh, now, uh, everybody uh, is following um, the recommendations that it has not to be given as an outpatient or home management. The important question here, is, uh, which a lot of people ask me and my colleagues, when to start hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine uh, before, uh, before having a chest X-ray or just coming to the emergency room with these symptoms, just confirming the case, uh, waiting to go to the uh, ICU if the patient will uh, develop uh, severe complications. In my opinion, and based on our clinical observations, I think it should not be started at the time the patient is intubated, as late as that, and the patient already is critical. You have to start it early. 
to be able to uh, get beneficial effect of these drugs, including the virologic uh, clearance, improvement of fever symptoms, and etc. Some other risk factors, some risk factors, laboratory and uh, clinical risk factors are associated with severe illness. Taking uh, or um, progressing patients with mild to moderate symptoms into severe form or critical. And these are the uh, inflammatory markers levels which are associated with significant uh, severity. The higher the level, the more significant severity. And the clinical risk factors are um, besides the age and elderly age is cardiopulmonary, diabetic, and uh, immune compromised host. Now, the severe, the third uh, category in the Ministry of Health uh, protocol is the severe illness, which is defined by the following, defined by respiratory rate more than 30 and uh, hypoxemia. It should be treated with supportive therapy, uh, infectious disease referral consultation, and considering early ICU transfer to manage hypoxemia early with ventilatory support with a nasal cannula, high flow, oxygen, uh, and the ventilation, and manage pneumonia with the broad spectrum, antibiotics, and combination antiviral. The antiviral uh, concept is to use a combination. Uh, let's say this patient was already on hydroxychloroquine and progressed, you continue and you add the antivirus. Um, however, th there is a group of antivirus. I'll leave that to my colleague, Dr. Anouf. Uh, she will uh, be talking to you about that. What, I'm tr uh, what I have to tell you here is that this protocol is, uh, the latest update is on April 12th. I think there will be an update of this protocol now based on the new changes in the uh, recommendations by the International Society and more studies coming up. Uh, but it's the same concept, combining antivirus for a strong uh, viral uh, uh, efficacy and uh, clinical response and better clinical outcome and watching clearly for a challenging drug-drug interactions and side effects. Critical illness. Critical illness is defined as uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, presence of sepsis, uh, either one of these uh, with, with associated with the initial presentation of the patient. In addition to having abnormal inflammatory markers elevated abnormally and high into certain levels, which are important for our parameters. Treatment will be the same as the severe case. And in the end, consider the um, cytokine inhibitors. If you remember the slide of the uh, pathogenesis, uh, critical illness and severe illness is caused by a cytokine storm. So uh, that part of the pathogenesis uh, can be so blocked. Doctor. So, uh, Afdal? Um, I don't know, maybe the network, but... And for critical cases, mechanically ventilated, um, compassionate use of remdesivir was approved by the FDA in the USA with a lot of uh, stormy debates around this drug. Uh, it's an experimental drug showing in vitro efficacy and antiviral activity. Um, I'll leave the uh, trials and the uh, evidence of this uh, new experimental drug in COVID uh, to uh, the next presentation. But there are some other uh, treatments. Other antivirals. And the tocilizumab with the drug-drug interaction. So in summary, the Infectious Disease Society guideline uh, of therapeutic uh, guides uh, management was published in April 11 and the Ministry of Health was um, following the literature closely. Um, our recommendations are consistent with the uh, international guides. Um, in summary, all of the antivirals I've talked about are recommended to be used in the context of a clinical trial. Now, there is no strong evidence against its use, but if it's going to be used, it should should be used uh, under a clinical trial. Um, 
the only thing is the corticosteroids. We know that corticosteroids should uh, be used in hospitalized patients, but not in the early phase, maybe in the late phase when they have ARDS. Um, the, the last part of the protocol, uh, the routine thromboembolic uh, prophylaxis, uh, giving the dose escalation according to the uh, D-diamer level uh, and the body weight. One minute, uh, Dr. for the time. And to standardize, and to standardize the uh, care for COVID patients, uh, MOH released the admission criteria. Uh, patients uh, suspected or confirmed uh, should be admitted to the hospital if any one of these criteria are present. Um, now coming to the asymptomatic and mild cases who are very stable, who cannot stay in a hospital um, until they are uh, clear for discharge, uh, they, they will be transferred into quarantine and isolation. But I just want to um, clarify the difference between quarantine. Quarantine is applied for asymptomatic close contacts or those who are coming, for example, from abroad. And the isolation, quarantine isolation is applied for those who are with symptoms but stable and no hypoxemia, no shortness of breath. Uh, quarantine is um, an Italian word uh, basically means 40 days of quarantine or isolation. Uh, 1,000 years ago, the policy was used by uh, the Muslim scholar Ibn Sina. In the facility, uh, we provide medical e evaluation by telephone triage and uh, based on our ex clinical experience only, we don't, we don't have laboratory and radiology, uh, but the medical evaluation will be closely provided for patients using these um, simple devices for uh, follow-up. Uh, in my opinion, the most common uh, treatment used, therapeutic uh, agents used in the quarantine and isolation are the antipyretic, the bronchodilators, and the antibiotics. Key messages. I end up by these uh, key messages uh, to all clinicians and healthcare workers. Uh, who must be able to, uh, to recognize COVID-19 atypical presentations. Um, there is no treatment is required for asymptomatic patients and to self-quarantine. They have to self-quarantine for 14 days. This is a common uh, issue because most of the patients will not be, um, uh, we will be asking about the treatment following the news and following the uh, media. No treatment is required for asymptomatic patients. And individuals with mild infection can be managed as an outpatient with prevention of transmission to others and monitoring for clinical deterioration. Patients with risk factor for severe illness and high mortality should be considered for hospitalization and further evaluation. And generally, there is no clinically proven treatment so far. By that, I end up my uh, presentation and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Farah. Um, um, and please stay with us. Uh, we will be ending the last 10 minutes with the question. And if there are any, any points that you would like to highlight, uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Anouf. Dr. Anouf Namatullah is a consultant uh, internist and infectious disease. He is holding the American Board of Internal Medicine and the American Board of uh, Internal Medicine uh, and Infectious Disease. Uh, the Royal College of Physician and Surgeon of Canada of Internal Medicine, the Royal College of Physician and Surgeon uh, of Canada and in Infectious Disease. Uh, she is currently working in the Cura uh, uh, Medical Center, and uh, she has a uh, extensive experience in uh, practicing and uh, training and teaching uh, infectious disease. Uh, Dr. Anouf Maana. <clears throat> Hayaki, 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 from the bottom. Are you? Yes. Okay, good. Let me take this off. Right. 
Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Salam Sayyid Muhammad. Uh, first of all, uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everyone, and thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to to give this talk. And uh, as you can see, I'm going to talk about the update and management of COVID-19. First of all, thank you, Dr. Zakia, for an excellent presentation. And you made my life easier because I will skip so many slides. <laughs> thank you. Okay, that's not working. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is updates in issues regarding infection control, uh, radiological and laboratory testing recommendation, and uh, treatment uh, therapeutic as well as immunization. I will skip this because Dr. Ra gave a, a good presentation about the clinical picture and the different stages and who need to be admitted and who doesn't need to be admitted. So skip to the infection prevention and control. Uh, the first question is, is SARS-CoV-2 airborne transmitted? Uh, just to clarify, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus and COVID-19 is the name of the disease. Uh, this is an important question for the implication for infection prevention and control, as well as protection of the healthcare workers. So is it airborne or not? Uh, studies, ex they did, there was an experimental study of uh, generated aerosol particles, and they found that the culture, the viral, the virus was viable in culture up to three hours, which was the duration of the study. In uh, clinical studies, they took uh, in, from several hospitals in China air samples, and they found detectable virus by PCR uh, with high uh, viral load in uh, areas that were uh, overcrowded. And they found that the transmission distance is probably more than two meters, up to four meters. From the USA, a study from the University of Nebraska looked at uh, air samples, and they also found positive samples, not only in the rooms of patients, but in hallways, which, which is an indication of possible airborne transmission. And they found that the virus was uh, discovered in distance more than six feet from the patient. So for healthcare worker protection, uh, a study from China looked at 41 healthcare workers that were exposed to patients undergoing aerosol generating procedure for 10 minutes or more at a distance of less than two meters. 85% of uh, persons were wearing surgical mask and 15 were using a respirator in the form of N95 mask. Uh, the, they did not isolate uh, SARS-CoV-2 by PCR from any of the uh, workers, and that was checked for a total of 14 days with an exposure. There is an interesting study from South Korea. You know, uh, we're always asking patients to put masks before they go to like outside and uh, to healthcare uh, institution to prevent transmission from patient to others. This study from South Korea looked at four patients with uh, COVID-19 disease, and uh, they asked them to cough into, uh, on plates uh, with mask, uh, first without the mask, and then with the surgical mask, and then with a cotton mask, and then again without the mask. And unfortunately, they found virus, uh, high viral load in all uh, specimens. Uh, it was in a reducing. It was reducing between the first uh, no mask and the cotton mask, and I think because the cough got weaker because it was like consequently. But when they removed the mask, the uh, viral load went up again. So in conclusion, uh, this virus is isolated from air samples and aerosols. The only thing regarding uh, the isolation in clinical uh, studies, they did not look at infectivity. So we don't know if this confer, confer infectivity to others. There is a possible, uh, the possibility of airborne transmission was shown in epidemiological study, but the evidence was weak. And in one study of healthcare worker, uh, the airborne transmission was ruled out, but there was not a single, I couldn't locate any single study that uh, looked at a healthcare worker who became sick or died of COVID-19 uh, with the risk of uh, transmission and how did they acquire the infection. Finally, transmission precaution should be applied even if the patient is wearing a mask. 
international recommendation they are divided the who and different european as well as australian and canadian guideline uh, stating that any patient in hospital require droplet and contact precaution unless there is uh, aerosol generating procedure and then it should be they should uh, use airborne precaution with the healthcare workers using respirator in the form of n95 or paper but the USA CDC and European CDC did not agree and uh, they recommended the use of N95 respirator for all unless they're not available then a surgical mask may do and then they all uh, recommended the use of negative pressure if the patient will undergo aerosol generating procedure uh, again for uh, protection uh, of uh, of individual in healthcare facilities to address the asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic transmission. It is recommended to implement source control for every person entering the hospital or the healthcare facility. And in addition, they should actively screen for symptoms. And this uh, include patients, visitors, as well as uh, healthcare personnel. And the healthcare personnel should have this uh, screen before every shift. This is a CDC recommendation. And uh, they recommended uh, if the patient uh, require, if the patient requires a sample for PCR uh, testing and the patient is intubated, uh, that to use endotracheal aspirate, not uh, bronchial alveolar lavage or bronchial wash to reduce the aerosolization of uh, particles. So, when to discontinue transmission-based precaution that was recently published by uh, uh, CDC. Uh, and it was divided into symptomatic and asymptomatic patient for symptomatic patient. And for both, for sy symptomatic patient, we have the symptom-based strategy and test-based strategy. Symptom is uh, at least three days after resolution of all symptoms and fever without the use of antipyretics plus 10 days since the onset of the very first symptom. And test-based strategy is resolution of all symptoms uh, without uh, the use of antipyretic for the fever, plus a negative PCR on two occasions, 24 hours apart or more. And for asymptomatic individual with positive PCR, there are, they divided them into time-based as well as test-based. The time-based is 10 days uh, after the first positive uh, test. And uh, this was recently changed before it was seven days. And the test base is again, the, having two negative PCR results within 24 hours or more. And they recommend also uh, consulting infectious disease expert if uh, there is a decision of discontinuation and uh, transmission-based precaution, especially in immune, severely immune compromised because of the risk of uh, prolonged shedding of the virus. So after uh, infection control, patient is in isolation, what's next? What is the role of a chest X-ray or chest radiology in the management of COVID-19? The Fleschner Society, which is a society of thoracic radiology, uh, published a multinational consensus on the role of chest imaging in patients with COVID-19 during the epidemic. And uh, to reach the consensus, they had three scenarios. I'm not going all, all into detail, but they divided the scenarios according to the feature, if it's mild, moderate, or severe, and the pretest probability in addition to uh, the look at the resource constraints. And I'll skip to the summary of the recommendation. Main recommendation is that imaging is not routinely recommended for asymptomatic individual. And uh, for mild features, the patient with mild disease, only recommended if there is risk of disease progression. They recommended the use of imaging in patient with moderate to severe COVID. And if, uh, if a patient with uh, COVID showed evidence of worsening respiratory status, then imaging is also indicated. In uh, resource constrained environment, if they cannot do CT scan because of resource for every patient, then chest X-ray is preferred. But if the patient had uh, 
any respiratory worsening that warrants CT scan, then it's better to do a CT scan. Additional recommendation, if the patient is intubated and stable, no change in the condition, please, no need for daily, just X-ray. And CT scan is indicated if there is functional impairment with hypoxemia in patient with COVID-19, uh, or instead of doing chest X-ray. And uh, finally, if the patient incidentally was found to have positive uh, CT, uh, imaging for uh, with sign more or less consistent with COVID-19, it is uh, indicated to do a PCR uh, from nasopharynx to confirm the diagnosis. Then uh, after we did the radiology, if it is required, uh, we move to the lab work. Uh, I'll just discuss the stuff that has a recent recommendation. So is there a role for the inflammatory markers in the management of patients with COVID-19? Uh, that was looked in a meta-analysis of 16 studies from China, and they found in a conclusion that C-reactive protein Procalcitonin, IL-6, and ESR were, were positively correlated with severity, even though other studies showed that procalcitonin generally is low, even in severe, in severe cases of COVID, unless there is secondary bacterial infection. The association of serum amyloid, A protein, and ferritin needs further uh, studies. And the uh, recommended uh, measurement to monitor and evaluate severity and prognosis. Uh, in terms of interleukin-6, which is one of the important uh, uh, inflammatory markers because of the cytokine, uh, the risk of cytokine storm and complications, uh, it was uh, found that elevated IL-6 was uh, strongly associated with the need for mechanical ven ventilation. And the maximum IL-6 level cutoff used was 80, predicted respiratory failure with high accuracy. The risk for respiratory failure in patients with a level more than 80 or more, they have a higher risk of respiratory failure, and that was 22 times higher than those with lower IL-6 level. So in conclusion, IL-6 is effective in predicting upcoming respiratory failure with high accuracy. Next, there was a lot of uh, talk about the uh, thrombosis and embolism developing in patient uh, with COVID-19. So what's the role of hyperglobality in the progression of the disease? Uh, one study looked at the D-dimer level and found that a level greater than one on admission was associated with higher odds of in-hospital death. And uh, for non-survival on admission, a higher level of D-dimer and fibrogen degradation product, as well as uh, elevated prolonged PT-PTT was, uh, was a significant finding. Elevated D-dimer with prolonged PT and low platelet correlated with mortality at 28 days. Heparin therapy reduced mortality by 20% if the D-dimer was more than three and mortality rose with rising D-dimer in patients who were not given heparin. Uh, another study looked at fibrinogen and D-dimer, and they found that they were significantly higher in patient than control. Coagulation profile observed reflect the, seve the severe hypercoagulability rather than consumptive uh, coagulopathy or DIC in this uh, study. Uh, that was a study from Italy. And 23% of patients developed in-hospital deep vein thrombosis despite being on anticoagulant prophylaxis. In a study from the US, from New York, a report of three patients with COVID-19 who were improving after successful treatment during the critical period, they developed PE and had increased oxygen uh, demand. And those patients were on DVT prophylaxis. They found that the three patients had elevated uh, D-dimer and two of them had severe, like highly elevated levels. Uh, venous and arterial thromboembolic complication in COVID-19 from a, a paper from Italy. Uh, they found that uh, the event occurred in around 8% of patient, 50% with diagnosis on admission. So you have to keep a high index of suspicion 
not every hypoxemia in a patient with severe COVID is just the viral pneumonia. Ischemic stroke occurred in 2.5% and uh, acute coronary syndrome with MI in 1.1%. Over DIC was only seen in 2.2%. And those patients were all on prophylaxis therapy. Uh, another disturbing um, paper came out recently, uh, which described five cases uh, of a relatively young individual who had very mild illness or even no symptoms, uh, presenting with large vessel stroke. Uh, those patients, uh, uh, three of the five patients with around 60% uh, of those patients had elevated D-dimer and elevated fibrinogen level they were not both elevated in all patients, in all three patients. So in conclusion, inflammatory markers may help in predicting disease severity. It may predict also early deterioration, deterioration if closely monitored. Monitoring is important because it may help in early decision-making regarding management, especially in terms of respiratory failure and cytokine storm. COVID-19 causes a hypercoagulable state and may also cause DIC, and you can find both sometimes in patients. And uh, the uh, thrombosis can occur in uh, macro or micro vessels. In addition, a monitoring lab parameter for hypercoagulability and DIC from admission is required and to be followed uh, uh, subsequently. Uh, start uh, thromboembolism uh, prophylaxis on admission if there is no contraindication. Early identification, we need to early identify patient and monitor patients who are at higher risk of event. Uh, we should have low threshold for imaging and therapeutic anticoagulation because sometimes imaging cannot be done. And uh, we, have, we have to find out a way to predict and prevent arterial and venous thromboembolism in asymptomatic mild cases. Next, I'll skip into the therapy now. And the therapy uh, is composed of antiviral. Uh, OK, a standard therapy. I will not discuss it uh, much, uh, even though they have, I'll just mention the strong recommendations. Uh, and then treatment of chronic comorbidity, we should remember that a patient admitted with COVID-19 is just only having COVID-19. Many of them have comorbidities and they are on chronic medication, so we should take care of this. But there was one question that was disturbing in uh, regarding the rule of uh, ACE inhibitor or ARB. Uh, in uh, possible increasing risk of uh, severe disease. Uh, and then antiviral immunomodulator and immunization. So for the antiviral, uh, this is a quick uh, scheme of like uh, the, uh, risk, the replication cycle of coronavirus. So the virus uh, need to attach to uh, ACE2 receptor for uh, entry. And this, uh, in addition to the ACE2 receptor, they need a transmembrane a serine protease type 2 receptor, which is, uh, which is, if it's not present, the virus cannot uh, attach to the, to the uh, cell. So what does this uh, protease do? It cleaves the S1 and S2 subunit in the uh, spike protein and allow the S2 subunit to attach to the uh, ACE2 uh, to ACE, uh, to receptor. Here we can have either the antibodies from monoclonal antibody or uh, the uh, antibody that uh, are produced by immunization or convalescent plasma, uh, also the antibody from a patient who recovered. Uh, would bind to the spike protein and inhibit the attachment to the cell. Uh, TMPRSS2, uh, there is a medication that is, uh, that is not used in the US, it's only present in Russia and probably Japan, uh, which inhibit uh, T, uh, the uh, transmembrane protease. And then after the virus attached to the cell, it will uh, release the RNA into the cell, this then the RNA would go into translation through ribosomes to produce polypeptide. Polypeptide need to be cleaved by proteases. There are two different proteases, 3CL protease and uh, LL protease. Lupinavir was uh, known from previous, from uh, 
re report with SARS-CoV-1 that it can inhibit the 3CL protease and 3CL protease was highly preserved in SARS-CoV-2 also. Uh, next, after the cleavage, uh, if it's not inhibited by lopiavir ritonavir, then uh, this would produce small peptide proteins. One of them, the most important is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase which is required for the translation of the RNA. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is where remdesivir as well as favira, favip, <laughs> the other one, <laughs> work. OK, we'll mention them. And then after that, uh, the uh, virus goes into, uh, into more translation and replication with the production of the new RNA. And then uh, the, the, uh, the transcribed RNA will go into Golgi apparatus as well as uh, endothelium reticulum for production of uh, structural protein, and then everything will be packaged together and a new virion will be produced. So oxygen therapy, in terms of oxygen, the supportive therapy, uh, it should be started. They suggest starting oxygen therapy as at, uh, if the oxygen is less than 92%, but the recommendation is to start supplement, uh, supplemental oxygen if it's uh, less than 90. They, are, they, dis, they are like- Two minutes, Victoria. Oh my God, okay. So uh, I will skip because I'll go to the uh, medications and uh, anticoagulation in a cohort, it showed that <coughs> uh, it's associated with improved outcome and benefit, especially in patients on mechanical ventilation, but there are no RCT. This was published yesterday. Uh, again, the recommendation of uh, the American Cardi Cardiology, College of Cardiology, Imperial College from England, and the British uh, Thoracic Society came up. The summary of the recommendation was uh, to use prophylaxis to all patients, higher dose may be used, depending on the patient risk. And in the context of clinical trial, full therapeutic dose should be started as soon as possible if you diagnose or suspect the diagnosis. Secondary bacterial infection is, uh, ha can happen. We cannot rule out bacterial infection on admission because it's, different to different, it's difficult to differentiate between bacterial and viral infection in severe pneumonia. And, uh, <clears throat> okay. and then the problem with, uh, with infection is, of course, most patients will be started on antibiotic, but we need to rigorously search for uh, a source of infection and uh, start empiric antibiotic with close observation and immediately change the management if the, according to the culture result. Antimicrobial stewardship at the time of coronavirus, uh, in a meta-analysis, they found that only 8% of patients had bacteria and fungal infection, while 72% of patients received antimicrobial therapy. So this is an area of uh, that we improvement. Uh, treatment of chronic uh, comorbidities. The important question was about ACE inhibitor and ARB because uh, there is the in animal study, ACE inhibitor and ARB can upregulate ACE2 expression in cells. And this is where, through which the virus enter. So there was a lot of talk about, do we have to stop the anti, the anti hypertensive or change it? Finally, uh, a question, uh, a paper came out on May 1st and it showed no increased risk of hospital in hospital death in patients uh, using ACE inhibitor. So this question was answered. Uh, in terms of uh, antiviral, uh, I will not touch a lot on, well, we have four main, main antiviral. Most of the studies are on the first three. The recommendation is, uh, there's no recommendation for or against chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, as Dr. Azakia mentioned, remdesivir. Uh, but for lopinavir, ritonavir, uh, they recommended against its use unless it is used in, uh, in the context of clinical trial. And uh, let me just go to one important, okay, here. Uh, this one uh, was, uh, this is a cohort of 55 patients, pre-symptomatic, all were given uh, lopinavir, ritonavir, non-developed symptoms. Of course, it was not a controlled, uh, controlled 
trial, so we cannot tell if this is just a natural natural uh, disease uh, recovery or if it's due to the medication. So uh, R uh, RCT are needed. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't seen any uh, any studies on the use as prophylaxis, but it might have a uh, role in prophyla in in pre post exposure prophylaxis. Uh, other studies did not show any benefit of lopinavir uh, over in patients with COVID-19, and uh, it was also uh, compared to another drug, Arbidol, uh, and none of them showed any uh, any benefit. This is uh, umifenavir, uh, and uh, it's uh, <clears throat> an inhibitor of hemagglutinin, and it was shown to have direct antiviral effect by inhibiting replication and uh, it's not present in the US, so they did not touch uh, upon it. Uh, other HIV proteins uh, are not uh, recommended for use. So uh, as I said, the verdict for uh, lopinavir is there is no strong evidence for efficacy. Limited study identified uh, subject uh, with methodological flaws and uh, several ongoing trial are currently recruiting. So we have to wait for those. Uh, <clears throat> So again, uh, I mentioned this one. The next is remdesivir, which is the most important currently. This is a nucleoside analog. It resembles adenosine. And so it resembles an RNA building subunit. Uh, it acts on the RNA dependent RNA poly polymerase. Okay. The way it acts is that uh, the RNA dependent RNA polymerase looks at uh, find the uh, drug and it, it think it's an uh, RNA block. Uh, so it incorporated into the nascent RNA. And unfortunately, after that, it stopped, well, fortunately, it stopped being able to add more RNA subunit. So it terminated the viral RNA chain. And the, the efficacy in animals was very, uh, was found to be positive, especially in prophylaxis and treatment early before the viral uh, replication. And uh, finally, there is a cohort of 53 patients uh, given uh, remdesivir and there was uh, improvement in uh, uh, the oxygen support, uh, support, the class of oxygen support. 47% uh, of patients were discharged and mortality was only 13%, mainly in patients on ventilation. This study was funded by Gilead. Uh, randomized the two randomized controlled trial. One was from uh, from China. Mm -hmm. Did not any evidence, uh, any improvement? But uh, this one is like just give me one uh, minute. Here, uh, <laughs> uh, this this is the one uh, that uh, had uh, lots of uh, headline in uh, the media. That was mentioned by the head of NIAID, uh, Dr. Fauci, and. Uh, it was a randomized controlled trial, uh, more than a thousand patients, and it uh, found that uh, remdesivir had 31% uh, faster time to recovery and was statistically significant with a survival suggestion of survival benefit, but was not stati statistically significant. Favipiravir act as remdesivir. The only positive thing about it is that it's an oral formulation, so possibly could be used as an outpatient prophylaxis, but uh, it's still under study and we don't have any updates on that. So recommendation, no evidence for or against antiviral, recommendation against the use of lopinavir uh, unless in uh, trial, clinical trial. And on May 1st, FDA issued an emergency use authorization for hospitalized patient, adult and pediatric uh, for the use of remdesivir. Yes. And, uh, okay. Immune modulation, uh, either uh, through the use of corticosteroid or IL-6 receptor. Uh, corticosteroid in study, uh, I will not go over this. Dr. Zakia explained this one. So uh, studies reported in uh, all retrospective, positive result with the use of uh, low-dose steroid, but should be used in the second or like according to the, the scheme, the figure that Dr. Ezeki explained, not early because it's used early can increase viral, uh, reduce viral crease replication and reduce uh, elimination and prolonged uh, viral shedding. Tocilizumab uh, in randomized controlled trial. Okay, I know. Uh, 
I'm okay. very sorry. I have to. I have to interrupt because we have only one minute. Actually, there is no time left for questions. I'm quite sure you you have presented very valuable information. Um, I don't know if we can conclude uh, by here because the time is allowed for us one hour only, and we are approaching that. Sorry for that, but uh, there were so many uh, interesting updates in the literature, and I was trying to get everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed the lecture myself, and I'm quite sure the audience they did. Uh, so, um, do you have a take-home message? Well, take-home message: uh, management of uh, patients starts from the minute you see them in the uh, emergency room. Uh, don't forget the uh, comorbidities, and please follow the guidelines of Minister of Health and uh, keep updated with the new uh, recommendations. Uh, Doctor Zakia Maana. My last message is uh, keep up with your clinical yes, judgment yeah. and uh, uh, trust your clinical judgment and your clinical experience. Don't rely only on laboratory and uh, radiology work. The diagnosis of COVID-19 illness is um, a clinical diagnosis uh, made compatible with a presence of um, uh, geographical link or exposure to uh, a known case. So uh, it's a clinical diagnosis and the clinical experience is um, valuable in quarantine isolations and in assisting initially patients uh, for admission to the hospital. Uh, thank you very much for this. Uh, I wish that we had more time uh, to discuss all the questions and I could see some of the questions already were posting and uh, most of it were answered already during the presentation. Um, there was one question that regarding the skin lesion in pediatrics. Dr. Zaki, you mentioned something about the skin lesion and immediately there was how frequent that would happen in pediatrics. It's rare, it's rare. Uh, now, dermatologic changes um, are one of the atypical uh, presentations of COVID illness. Uh, it was noticed and reported. Uh, there are several reports of, uh, worldwide. Um, the, uh, initially, um, Kawasaki disease, which is fever, uh, swelling of hand and foot was reported by China, uh, reporting only 15 cases. So it's rare. Uh, however, it's good to keep it in mind. There are more reports coming now uh, in the literature. Uh, the more common uh, presentation was the maculopapular rash, which act actually we've uh, came across it. Um, evaluating almost more than 400 cases uh, with COVID illness, uh, I think atypical features are good to keep in mind in some susceptible cases uh, who are uh, young adults, uh, not immune compromised, but still uh, coming with atypical features. So keep your mind open for uh, all typical and atypical presentations. After patient got discharged from the hospital, uh, for how long the room should be uh, keep vacant? And if there is a chance that the virus would be still there? Well, I think, uh, I don't know about the policy and of the Ministry of Health, but I think that the room needs uh, rigorous uh, sterilization. And uh, I think 24 hours should be enough. Okay. But we don't yeah. have studies that tell us if like within 24 hours, the viral uh, particle would disappear, like viral load will be zero. And even the study that, that shows that there is positive uh, PCR from air sample, they did not look at uh, the uh, culturability of those, uh, of those particles, like was of the sample. They did not culture it to see if there is viable uh, virus in that or just particles which because the pcr only reveals like part of the rna it's not like a yeah. whole virus. okay thank you very much i would like to thank dr anof and dr zakia for the very interesting and uh, amount of information it was very uh yani interesting we i we wish that we had more time and I would like to extend my thanks to Dr. Zainab Azzuddin, who was contacting everyone, trying to arrange that uh, through Idara Tashoun al Academy or Tidrib, the Mudriya Tashoun al Sahiya Thank you very much. And Nasal Allah Salam al Jamia.
ونسال الله ان تكونوا استفدتوا وشكرا لكم دكتورات الله يجعله في ميزان حسناتكم ويجعله علم نافع شكرا مره تصبحوا شكرا دكتوره نسرين شكرا للجميع شكرا.